Section 2, page 13. Costs of retail properties. Now, the truth is, the retail properties, it really should have been broader because most of these expenses that we're discussing, I know it says retail properties on top, I think that's one of the mistakes in the book, it's more broad to commercial properties. Anything but home, anything but apartment building. So, the first cost of leasing commissions. Securing an anchor or credit tenant almost always requires a broker to make the connection. Lots of red tape and bureaucracy stand in the way of an investor reaching the corporate office of a national chain. A leasing commission will be paid to the leasing broker, typically a percentage of the yearly lease payments for the life of the lease. So when you're dealing with, in corporate America, and you have Walmart, Walmart has a leasing department. And many times to build a relationship, they take your call, they take you serious, it takes a long time. So when they finally there's a broker that has a good relationship with Walmart, if someone is looking to lease space with Walmart, they would go and call up through that broker and that'll be their, their way in. Sometimes Walmart doesn't want to get bothered by a bunch of strangers. So they set up like exclusives. In this market, you're my exclusive agent. Some everyone has a different theory of exclusives good, exclusives bad, how to set things up. But many times the, the stores don't have someone that they want you to be the go-between and he either has to get a full commission, there's two brokers involved, you split it, but that's, the, that's across the board on leasing commissions. Our leasing commissions are very, very, very expensive. Because basically it's like a sale. If I sell a building, you could ask for a 6% commission, a negotiated 6%, there's a five, there's a four, there's a three, it's a sale price, you sold the building for $10 million, the commission could be 300,000, 400,000, 500,000 dollars, that's the commission. When someone leasing space, it's the closest to a sale. This space is not taken off of the market for the life of the next 10 years, 15 years. And you brought someone that kind of value, you have to get paid for that kind of value you're bringing. See, as a mortgage broker, I charge 1% of the loan amount. And with competition, with negotiating, many people start negotiating their price down as the transaction gets larger. Because they could say, the larger the transaction, the easier it is to place it at the banks because more banks want it. Typically, who owns a larger deal? A stronger borrower. So he has relationships with banks. He could get that done accordingly. So if you put all those pieces together, it uses, it's against me. But the other end, if I have a, someone has a vacant space, it's not like they quote the same three banks. They don't, have, they don't know who's looking for space. The largest real estate show of the year is a show, it's in Las Vegas in May, and it's a leasing show. The primary purpose of the show is leasing. The main people who come there are tenants and landlords on the retail center. Because of that, we go. Because there's a room full of developers and owners. I want to be there to do the mortgage. <clears throat> when you walk through this room, there are a bunch of, of, of the booths are, you know, you have a booth. Walmart takes a booth. You have Starbucks takes a booth. McDonald's takes a booth. And these, are, these booths are larger than the, than the square footage of this building, the, the, tank, the, the plate. Because once they're in the booth, <clears throat> it's probably also the first time during the year that all the landlords who have, McDonald's as tenants, or all the leasing brokers that are involved in leases, or the owners of the stores are all come there as the first meeting place. They have a, a lot of the spaces, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous booths that they set up because it's their brand, <clears throat> but it's also a lot of meeting space inside it that, that goes on. So a lot of times you walk through and you just to get an idea how tough it is that part of the business where you'll have a lot of leasing brokers. I mean, you'll have a lot of new tenants. So when Krispy Kreme was first opening up, this is where they opened up to. They had a booth there. They took a prominent booth that was their advertising. And they had this map on the wall, and that's how most new, new stores open, this big map on the wall with, where they're looking to go. So if, if I'm a developer, I walk by and say, oh, you're looking at that area? I own a piece of land there. Maybe let's develop it around what you're looking for. Or I have a shopping center there. Or leasing brokers walk through to try to get themselves those connections. On the flip side of the coin, many landlords have, have booths there. <clears throat> and they have maps on the, on the wall the other way around. We have vacancies. So I could be walking by, I'm thinking about opening up a, a business, and I spoke or a chain or whatever it is like that, and I go for it. So every store that you know today <coughs> that's in business, at one point, that store was just a nothing. Starbucks today is something, but it was a nothing at one point. They came to this booth like, oh, we're going to have this coffee shop, and let me tell you why it's great. 
Now they have to pitch the landlords to say, like we discussed till now, I want a no name. I want, oh, I believe in your business. You're gonna really take off. I'm gonna get you in now and I'll sign a long lease. And they were getting the first leases that, that, that Starbucks signed, I'm sure pretty expensive. Because in the better locations who wanted them. Now it's the opposite. Which mall doesn't want a Starbucks. Because Starbucks is a, is a draw and it's own right for people to come there. But that's where the, the pendulum switches all goes on. So when I have a, a space that's vacant, who has the power to make my deal a good deal? The leasing broker. I have one banker who told me he used to own a lot of real estate. He goes, when I want, wanted to rent space, I'd offer a, t- a commission and a half to the leasing broker. I don't care what you cost me if they want to go again. But I know that I'll be the first on the list. There's always movement in a market. That's the key thing. I could sit there and say, I'm very nervous. The real estate market may slow this year. Purchases may slow. That's the case. The number of transactions I'm going to have to finance as a mortgage broker is going to slow down. When I get nervous, it might go about 30%, they go 50%. If you step back for a second, it's $400 billion worth of real estate financed a year. If it was cut in half, and only $200 billion took place, and all I'm doing is three and a half billion dollars in the scope. It really shouldn't affect me to slow down 50%. It does, 50% is 50%, because at, a 400, at 100%, I got three and a half billion, so maybe 50%, I get a billion seven. But if you step, it depends what numbers you're looking at. But since there's always movement, so the key is go to the person who controls the movement, the leasing broker. Because when that tenant wants, wants space from its landlord, what does it do? It goes to a leasing broker usually to find it, find its space. If, the, if a leasing broker finds space, then if this lease work is going to control, if I'll get a tenant or next door is going to get a tenant, pay a higher commission to get that business. In. Because most real estate owners are thrifty, cheap, or this and that, and they try to cut the middleman out as much as they can. And he goes, this is where I never had vacancies in my building because everyone knew I'll never play with them. I'll pay them the commissions up front. And I'll ne- even when I think of upper hand, when the market's hot and everyone wants my building, I treat those guys the same way. I might not pay them time and a half, but I treat them all the same way. So the market's tough, who are they coming to first? I never had vacancies. So when I bought buildings, and people said, oh, you're crazy in that market. 20% vacancies or office space or retail space. I never had that. If there's enough tenants moving around, I know I'm getting the premium tenants because the leasing brokers have a, have, a, have a reason to push them in my direction. So the commission is very high. The commission sometimes can be as high as 5% for the life of lease. And I think it's a sliding scale how it works there. So if they have a lease that's $100,000 a year, a 10 year lease, it's a million dollars, is a $50,000 commission paid day one, which potentially means that the guy's putting a tenant in, he's only getting half of his first year rent, because half is going to leasing, to leasing broker. So if you're looking at that as an example, it gets really crazy. So just think, I, have, I, I, I want to get a tenant in my building, I get a tenant, I can't afford to get the tenant. The market's $100,000, I can't afford to get it. That's why there's something called good, good news a good news credit facility, it's like the lingo, something like good news, uh, good news money. What's good news money? <clears throat> a guy comes to a bank and says, give me a loan. Give me the rights to come back for more money, good news money. But if I sign a lease, you'll give me the money to help me actually bring in, that, bring in the tenants that are relevant to, <clears throat> to make the whole lease, to make the whole thing take place. That's as, that's as far as the leasing commission goes. In addition to the leasing commission, you have tenant improvements. On a residential, when a tenant moves out, moves out, the cost is usually limited to a paint job and some minor improvements. There's nothing really to happen. They paint the space, maybe they clean the carpet, they might rip out of one or two carpets, but even if they do, the landlord probably today has the same commercial carpet grade that he buys all the time. He, even if he doesn't, he's getting a local store at a Home Depot, and how much is the carpet to put into the carpet? Yeah, it's, you know, it's nothing. So the, the turnover cost is very, very little to make, things, to make things take place. The, the second part of it is, is the office, office space. It's not much different. Some minor changes may be needed to accommodate the new tenant, but not, not, as, not at a prohibitive cost. Now, I wanna go off tangent on this for a second, but that's not a typical regular office space. When you sign this class A office space, and someone's signing 20,000 square feet, 200,000 square feet, there's a lot more involved in charging higher rents. I can't just move in. When I took space before I moved into this, into this space we're in here now, pretty much every moved into, the, the landlord moved a couple of walls here and there. But when I moved here and we took this amount of square footage and the landlord says, sign a longer lease, I said, if I'm doing that, I want it to look exactly the way I want it. So part of my lease terms were, is that we're gonna give you an allocation of paying whatever dollar foot, 
we're going to give you five dollars a foot towards build out so i was able to hire an architect and lay out the space of course six dollars for the build out i paid a dollar's worth and he paid five dollars worth so again before he got me in here we saw about this huge leasing commission and the cost of the fit out the retail unit if you have a pet to go move out and a burger king move in the cost of improvements could be astronomically high because you have to put in the kitchen and you have to do different types of things. On the other hand, they try sometimes that a restaurant we keep to a restaurant. So you try to get that same use. If one restaurant leaves, probably the next restaurant will stay the same exact way. But on the other hand, what happens today is that because of the internet streamlining, if someone's thinking streamlining, they have all the fast food places on the internet. And a lot of the restaurants there start to become like, they want to be like totally different. So to a certain extent, totally different is cheap. I went into a dinner in, in Brooklyn, one of the hipper, hipper neighborhoods, and the building was in a way that the, the restaurant's in a warehouse. And it, it literally is a warehouse on the left, there's a warehouse on the wall, right? You walk inside, it's, it's, it's like a 30 floor sail, 30 foot sailings. And they, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's cheap in what it costs them to set up, but it has that, like, they're supposed to be like a new look and like exposed brick on all the sides. I actually thought the roof wasn't like a real roof. It looks like, you know, they put some sort of covering or something. I actually thought that they opened up the restaurant. I'm still convinced that there's a, a restaurant, there's a wall on this side from, the, from this warehouse, a wall on this side. I'm convinced they just put up a glass doorway in the front and a roof on top and they didn't build a building. That's I think, they're, and there's a restaurant inside. So it's built that way and then you're right, they don't have a lot of costs going in. But for the most part, you can have a lot of costs going back and forth, from one space to the next, what they need. Industrial property, in some cases, it can be impossible to detail your unit according to the tenant's needs due to heavy equipment and machinery. So sometimes <clears throat> industrial property is very easy. It's one big open warehouse. Flex space is like a mixed use idea. It's, it's industrial, but inside in the corner, they just put up a, a wall, three, two walls around one corner, and this way they have like a, little, a few offices there. So it's industrial space, raw space, but now sometimes there's a lot of heavy equipment to move it in, move it out. There's costs to bring it. It, um, um, tenants in. But for the most part, if you look at it, I have these costs, leasing commission, which is huge. Then I have tenant improvements. And after that, you just have concessions. It's not an expense, but it's a reality. I signed a lease today. I'm not ready to move in for three months. It's doing work. It's three months, he's not collecting rent. Sometimes they say, I also want three months of free rent when I do move in. It'll be six months. So he's first collecting rent for me in six months. He has to lay out a lot of money to the leasing commission, the leasing broker. He has to lay a lot of money to construction, and then he gets me in. So that's why you have certain landlords, on the other hand, who aren't into finance. They sometimes buildings for a vacancy. They say, listen, the market's $20 a foot. For you, I don't want to deal with any of these headaches. Maybe $16 a foot, do all the work yourself. So if I'm into financing, I'd rather do the work myself because mathematically it comes out if I lay out the money and then I take a mortgage later based on a higher NOI, I could borrow more money back and have the money, I could do a lot of different things with it. So not with the finance sometimes, keeping it simple, like it's charge lower rent. Think about people who have a basement in their house. They could rent it out. To rent out that basement, you could take it and you could pay $30,000 to rent it out. And one way to look at it is you don't make back your money for two years. That's when you're not at the finance, that's how you look at it. If I'm going to charge rent twelve fifty a month, Take me two years to break even. That's not the sophisticated way you look at it. You're looking at it that I'm putting in $30,000. The next time we have to put in money is in 15 years. If I do maintenance of $1,000 a year, but not for the first few years. So I have a $30,000 investment throwing off $15,000 a year to me. That's not a 50% return because it's only for the lifespan of 15 years. But you could look at it that over the life of 15 years, if you got the IRR, your equivalent return was 12%, 14%, 9%, you got a return. That's the two ends of being sophisticated or not. And sometimes someone has a basement apartment in their house and they say, listen, I'm not redoing it. The market's $1,200, I'd rather just pay me $500, do what you want. And that's how people do it. And sometimes the return, like I know in, in the city that I, that I live in, in Lakewood, is a, is a, there's one area that was like starting to turn around, but like a slow process of the turnaround. And somebody took, uh, I, had a, I had an office space there. They used the ground floor office and the top was like really raw. Like it was a four story building, no elevator, really raw space. And uh, the tenant 
that time went to the landlord. I told the landlord, you're not using upstairs anyway. <clears throat> I could use it for storage, whatnot. It might be worth it to me to make it nice, but I'm gonna make it nice on your dime. If you gave me a 30 year lease at $2 a foot, I'll take it. They took it, $30 lease, least, like some crazy loan number. The landlord was ecstatic, he got money for nothing. The tenant was happy, he also had storage space there. And at one point, as the area got a little bit better, people were willing to move in there. The landlord fixed up some of the space and charged $10 a foot they were, with the right to sublet. So he was able to now make $8 a foot. Obviously at one point, the lease comes due, you know, everything goes back to the landlord, but he made a fortune just by, by the leases, by reselling out the leases. So that's why commercial real estate is very, very costly to get in. I think that after all that, a tenant goes bankrupt after a year. You're up to creep. So that becomes a very, very big issue. On the flip side of it, there's also benefits on the retail property. Like everything else, there are benefits to the flip side. Triple net leases. A strong positive of many retail tenants is that many of the leases are NNN, which stands for triple net. Meaning all expenses are paid for by the tenant. Every dollar of rent is directly net income. Some may not pay all expenses, but reimburse partially real estate taxes, for example. Let's go with the triple net lease a true triple net lease. The problem is there's no legal <coughs> terminology. A triple net means you're paying for this expense. Double net, only this, these expenses. And single net, there's no real word for it. There's no real guarantee. So people could like mix and match what they want. So what a true triple net lease is, I right, see Walmart leases. Walmart signs a lease with the landlord. It says 25, 25 year lease. This is what I'm paying you. If your rent goes up every year, I'll cover everything. I'll cover my snow removal, I'll cover repairs and maintenance, I'll cover infrastructure, I'll do everything. I'll pay the taxes every year. You have to do nothing for the next 25 years. Now, now that Sears is having the problems, but if you understand why Eddie Lampert bought into Sears, it's because he bought it and said, a lot of these companies sometimes had a lot of real estate. And sometimes if I'm already signing a 25 year lease, one of them is own the building, one of them is buy the building. Think about what happened. Some guy bought a building, Knowing he's going to lease it to Walmart is making a killing. Walmart just buy the building themselves. They look, scowl around, they find a place to buy it. They're anyway taking all the responsibility. A lot of reasons why they don't buy it is because you have to update your balance sheet of the values. And sometimes real estate goes up, real estate goes down, and keeps changing, and it affects other parts of their operation. If you have a rent, it's very simple. This is what I pay. My expense are this, and I move on. So you're right, my expenses could go up, but I don't know, there's no other added liabilities or whatnot that go on. So the business, more business savvy places actually went and they, they started buying some of the real estate. Sometimes they didn't buy the real estate, but there's so much room to do things because it, to take out the value of the real estate, the value of the leases that they signed. If they had the right to sublet the space, they signed the lease 15 years ago. In a 25 year lease, there's always a point when you can say 15 years ago. So there's always, if inflation kicks in, it's always gonna be a low rent compared to the market at that time. But why was it fine for the landlord? Because he has no expenses. Most landlords marked the market. They actually took that lease, took a loan that was fixed for 25 years that matched it. So it was a coupon cutter. They got the wire in from Walmart. They paid their payments and life went on at that point afterward. And that's how they, that's how they operated. So that's not a triple net. Sometimes you don't have a triple net, but at least you know some of your expenses are covered. Or from the base here, I said, this year, he made a deal based on the market on a going forward basis. I, the tenant, would pay your increase on a going forward basis. But on your current basis, I'm not paying. I'm not paying for anything more at that point. When a retailer's business is doing well, often is in the tenant's best interest to stay put in his location due to the cost. The cost is familiarity. This gives the property owner confidence of a long-term tenant. So, when a tenant is in a building and he's doing well, like a retail tenant, they don't move. Because you go, go to the store. Office space, no one really comes here. And before they do, they ask, what's your address? And they send a calendar invite for them to come to the meeting. So once the store's doing well, they typically stay put. That's how, how do you know if a store's doing well? The lingo is, what are your sales per square foot? And if you're this type of store, that's called a good number. This type of store, this is called a good number. That's how you go ahead and operate. But the relationship many times between a landlord and a tenant in a retail center is a level of a partnership. They're in a partnership together, the landlord and the tenant, because they have the best interest of the two of them 
to make the to make the to make the each to make each each of them become successful, because if it's not just like I have a tenant and my landlord couldn't care about how my business is doing, the landlord cares about how each tenant is doing if they can. They want to try to help the tenants. There's some landlords that actually go and spend time with the tenants to give them ideas how to make better signage at the store, ideas of different sales. Why? Because the stronger each tenant is, not only would it give them a chance to stay there longer, <clears throat> they could probably charge a higher rent when they renew. Probably on the vacant stores, they could charge more rent and there'll be less vacancies. Because when, when you have a store, a new store I'm opening up, where would I want to be? I'd want to be next to the local, the best pizza shop in town, the, 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 the food store, the, the, all the popular side stores, I'd want to be there. I already have foot traffic. My whole job is my conversion rate. There are already 10,000 people that come a week to this location. How many of them can I get to walk into my store? And for them, they already parked the car. They're already in, inside. They can look, oh, let me check it out. How many times do you drive by a store and say, interesting, what's that store? You're not stopping special to go look at it. But anytime you said that, if you were in a mall and you're walking right past the store, you're gonna go ahead and get it done. And that's that back and forth. On the flip side of the coin, that little tenant only signed the lease because an overpaid because they were camping on the traffic of the big tenants. So here's what happens a lot of times. You know, when you're, when you hear that the grocery store just bought across the street, the location and moving across the street, and you find out, oh, you're nervous for the landlord. He goes, no, nah, don't worry, they have a 20-year lease. The tenant's paying anyway for the next 20 years. And you say, yourself, okay, he's lucky. He still gets his rent. It's terrible for him. Because sometimes the clause, called co-tenancy, is a clause that that pizza shop has the right to leave if the anchor is out, number one. Number two, no one's coming into the center anymore. So the foot traffic is down. Over time, the side stores are gonna have issues and become non-existent at a certain time. So the retail dynamic, why it's, you see the domino effect now. It's not just that Amazon is hurting certain stores, but the remaining stores are relying on the foot traffic of the other stores. And that alone has become the domino. The domino. So Amazon is not necessarily killing certain stores, it's directly, but indirectly, it's killing certain stores. And indirectly, it's killing certain malls because certain stores have the right to renegotiate the contracts. So your landlord, not just that you lose one tenant, you have a chance to lose a few tenants, and the remaining tenants stay because you renegotiated with them. So one little bankruptcy could totally wipe someone out. That people that track every single time a retail store files a bankruptcy, makes a correction, and sees what's the domino effect that's going to take place. Let's take a look at a retail property setup. This setup was prepared to be sent out to Wall Street lenders. The reason why I say Wall Street lenders, what I mean by Wall Street lenders, is CMBS, commercial backed, commercial backed securities, mortgage securities. Um, when you're, when you're, the, the, what's relevant to you um, to know about Wall Street lenders is that Wall Street lenders don't lend money with a personal guarantee. There's no personal guarantee. It's all based on the math and logic. The whole system is math and logic. So if you're able to be logic-based, you could be, have come with any creative solution they'll listen to you. There's no emotion. You're also dealing with very sophisticated people who are making a lot of money in every one of these transactions. Their motives are aligned with you. Make a deal happen. They have no ulterior motives. You just have to logically explain to them how they can put into the box and get financed. This is where certain people thrived when this market opened. On the other hand, it came so much to the point of creativity and how much money was involved that caused the mortgage, the, the crash of mortgage-backed securities crashed because it just kept, and I'll, I'll talk about it soon, how it got to the end. What's relevant for this next page is that that's what you'll see. When I go through the numbers with you, you know, when you talk about, you know, certain things when it comes to a bank on the initial setup, I'm talking to a banker. This is the way they underwrite it. I'm sorry. This is, this is regulation. This is, by company policy. There's no company policy. It's all logic based. I have a reason that I can explain why, even though normally a bank should underwrite a deal, A, B, and with a 5% vacancy, I have a reason why this should be a 4% vacancy or a 6% management, a 2% management, reserve like this, reserve like that. If I can explain it to you, logically you'll get it done. And that's how this whole thing works. So that's, for, that's, the, that's the point of pointing out that it's a Wall Street lender. So we went through before going through a deal. And it's the same exact type of information that's over here. I 
want to show you, just quickly go through the parts that are, that are exactly the same, that you're familiar with, and explain to you conceptually why it's the one part here that was fascinating to me about this whole entire business, how scientific it is, and then explain that to you in detail. So open up your eyes to a whole new world of how you view things. So the parts that are easier, the top part. Property description, the address of the property, fine, great. Proposed loan terms, it's looking for $22 million. Works out loan per square foot, $37.44 a square foot. The reason why they wanna, they wanna they, they focus on this point to see it here is because, again, someone knows rents in this neighborhood are blank a foot. So it's, it's a high loan to value, low loan to value. You know, what does it work out to? Because the lingo is per square foot, so they convert everything to a per square foot basis. Most loans are a 10-year loan, so the note term is 10 years. Amortization is a 30-year amortization. Index, that's probably what, what, what t, 10 year TIBA was the day we printed this up, um, probably. Um, the spread is that's the profit margin that the Wall Street lender wants to make. Again, if you go to the app, on the app, you go to the rates, it'll tell you CMBS pricing, what the range is, that's this number, that's the spread. You know, this, it, it keeps moving. For this deal, they actually quoted 265 at that time. What is the actual mortgage rate? If the person was to close today, what's his rate? 4.91%. So this person had a loan constant, his fixed constant that he has here is 6.36%. That's really what's relevant for this section, this left side of the section here. I just want to put into perspective so you understand. There's not a lot of business that goes on in CMBS today. I think the 65, $65 million is being done this year in CMBS. In the heyday of the market, it was like 400 million. When it was really cranking out and fluid and moving, they were able to, they knew exactly how much, what, you know, it's, when a bank lends money, go back a second, when a bank lends money to you, they lend money at a interest rate of 4%. Why don't they charge you exactly their cost and their profit margin? Because then they could charge you three and a half percent, let's say. The reason why they're charging you four over three and a half is because there's moving, <clears throat> there's moving pieces to the puzzle. There's a half a point that what if rates go up? So they have to buy insurance, for lack of a better word, with that money. So they have to put away money for the just in case. But if you knew, or you'd come to a bank and say, listen, Henry, lend me at your cost. If your rates go up, your costs go up, I'll cover that in the difference. The rate would be going in at 3.5% probably. Some difference, I don't know what the number is, but there's a difference. I'm using a big number so you can accentuate the point. When a Wall Street lender closes a loan, what happens is, is they make a loan of $100 million of money. They close 10 million here, 14 million here, 27 million here, 31 million here, 2 million here, 6 million here. It equals 100 million. They take the $100 million with the loan. They bundle them together as a security, as one loan. And they go out to the marketplace and sell it as a bond deal and say, do you want to have, do you want, and the blended rate of return is not 4.91, it's 4.3, let's say, or 5.1, and say, do you want to get make 5.7% of your money for the next 10 years? Basically, do you want to put your money in treasuries and make 2%? Make 10 years, make your money 2%, or would you like to make 5%? And what is it backed by? What am I secured by? Oh, you're secured by $100 million of real estate, actually $140 million worth of real estate, and 75% loan to value, so we have $100 million worth of real estate. And it's blended all the real estate combined together. Do you want to go ahead and make that return you're looking for? And if a person says yes, they buy that security. The problem is that a bank closes on January 1st. They collect interest. The, the Wall Street shop collects interest. And they might not secure it, put into a pool until April. What happens between now and April? The, the market that someone wants to see a return on securities on a, on a mortgage-backed securities is they want 5.5%. So in order for them to throw off a 5.5% return, they're going to have to take a little bit of a loss because no one's, they're going to have to guarantee the investor out of their own pocket some of their profits because there's not enough money to go around. They close the loan collecting this amount of money. So what do they do to deal with it? They, when, they, when they price this loan originally, they could have really done this loan and not 491, it's 461. They're charging 491 just in case when they sell it to market, the 461 goes all the way up to 491, they're still covered. So let's go back so it becomes clear. It was just one loan. 
assuming this was one loan for $100 million. Today, a security was sold. $100 million worth of loans were sold, and the buyers demanded 4.61%. So if I'm lending new money today, I know that when I'm going to sell it in three months, probably the same thing. I'll sell it for 461. So as long as I could keep my expenses under 461, I'm covered. So I lend out the money at 461. I'll get in 461. You're going to buy the security from me, and you're going to want to collect 461. And everything is perfect. It's a perfect sweep that goes through. Everything is fine. But what happens by the time I call you up, you say, hmm, not 461. I want to make 490. I'm losing money. In order for me to sell it to 490, you're not going to, I'm going to have to take a loss because I'm going to have to cover, so to speak, that difference to make you whole. So what they're doing now is they actually go and they lend it and that 491. They don't lend me originally at 461. They lend it out at 491 in anticipation to deal with potentially when I come to you at 491. So if I come to you at 491, I'm fine. If I come to you and I go the other way around, it goes down to, you only, you have four and a half percent. I make now a profit margin from 491 to four and a half for the next 10 years. Every year I'm making that on a, on a hundred million dollars. I'm making that profit margin. It's a lot of money over 10 years. I'm making a $4 million over those 10 years. So when the market is fluid, there's always movement in the market. Take a stock. If I was buying a stock today, I know what I could, if I, I could sell at any moment. I buy it today, I know I could sell it a minute later. The odds are it's not changing within a minute. So it's not that much risk. But if I knew I'm buying it today, I have to hold it for sure for four months, or for sure for a year, and I have to think to myself before I buy it, do I have a cushion in there, what if? I have to deal with the what if scenarios. When the market was at $400 million a year being done, it was so fluid that you didn't wait three months till securitized. Pretty much, a bank closed loan today, by Friday it was already bundled with a bunch of other banks and they sold it out. There's so much movement going on. There's very little risk there. Plus, I didn't just have one person to sell it to, I had 100 people to sell it to. So I created a competition. And there were no losses in real estate yeah, those years, before 2000, before the crash. So. You would say, okay, 460, 455, 450, uh, you 440, I sold it to you. I made a killing. I was in a 490, 440, four, I sold it out of 440. A guy only wanted to take 440 from me. What happened is some new shop came in and said, listen, I don't make that much money. I'll lend it out. I would stop lending money at 470. He got all the business. And there's more competition. Plus, there's no losses. Before you knew it, the rates went down and down and down, and that's what went to. In the heyday of the market, when Wall Street made a loan, that spread was 91 basis points. That means if, if the market was so fluid and running today and people believed in real estate and they trusted the CMBS metrics and they trusted everything, a rate today would be three, a 10 year money would work out to be 3.2% would be the rate would be locked for 10 years. But today the rates are locked at 4.9%. Sometimes those interest rates are up a little just the profit margin that's needed to deal with all the risk and all the different people that are in the puzzle. That's because of the volume work went out because of the volume. When you trust something, you want to make less. When you trust the less, you want to make more. When I don't know if I'm able to even sell it later on, it becomes a bigger problem. It comes, it gets worse and worse and worse. So that's on the left side of this page here. On the right side of the page, there's a new thing that's been added in the last couple of years. It's called a debt yield. Same way like a cap rate is for if I bought a building for all cash, the debt yield is what, how much can I borrow? My NOI, what's the most they're willing to lend me if I apply like a cap rate for a debt, just like a cap rate for value? So if I have, a, if I have an NOI of $90,000 and the cap rate is nine, the building is worth a million dollars, 90,000 divided by 9%. A debt yield is telling me how much is a bank willing to lend me? They need to make sure that if I have an NOI on a property, the debt yield of nine, the same, you apply it the same way. 90,000 divided by the debt yield is how much they're willing to go ahead and, and lend you. What return do they need on the debt yield? Why do they have a debt yield? What's the concept of the debt yield? The concept of the debt yield is as follows. Understand the simple form the other way. You could relate to that a bank says, I'm lending you money. I want you to have a debt service coverage ratio. We have enough money we discussed, discussed before that what if, you have a problem with the building, you have a cushion that aside from your mortgage payments, you have money left over to deal with the cushion. Plus, what if in 10 years from now, interest rates spike, spike up much higher? So they want to make sure that at that time, you will have enough money to be able to borrow later on at a later date, you'll have enough money to be able to go ahead and do things. The debt yield, well, what came confusing is 
is that it wasn't really, not confusing, but it wasn't consistent across the board, depending on the amortization and depending on the actual rate you're going in would, would affect how much they're willing to lend you with debt service coverage. But to deal with all the credit risk, someone actually ran an analysis and figured out that you could get to the same, you could get to the same exact number that you, that you get to the same exact number. Um, you get to the same exact number on a deal of, 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 um, of the risk tolerance by applying a debt yield. It sums that up together. Instead of getting confusing, how much can I borrow the debt service coverage? A debt yield is one number and you can go with it across the board. So banks incorporate an easy way of doing it. If your NOI is this, I'm never lending you more than this amount of money or that amount of money, it's never gonna happen. I'm gonna lend you money at this ratio versus that ratio and have a nice day, go home from that point and don't bother me beyond that. So when I call up a lender today, I can just know what your debt yield is. What's the minimum debt yield, which is which comes out what's the most you're lending. The lower the debt yield, the more I can borrow. So if you skip to the bottom of the page, the bottom of the page, if you have a projected NOI before 10 and improving the leasing commission, the bottom right corner, and you have a debt yield of nine. So if you take $2 million of NOI divided by 9%, let's say the most a lender is willing to lend you on this transaction is 22 million, nine twenty-four. Gives you an example. This building is trading. If you look at, if you look at value for a second, a, a, the cap rate always has to be lower than the debt yield to work. Right? Because if the cap rate is also applied, it's going to put you what the value of the building is. The lower the number, the higher the value. So if a bank's willing to lend me twenty-two million, the value of the building must be a lot more than that. So it works as a loan, as a as a value. So if you look up the line, two lines above from the from the bottom of the page on the right side. In this case, if the cap rate was eight, you had a you projected NOI. That's why I thought there was a mistake here. So I'm going to explain it to explain it in a minute. But if you have a if you have a two million four, um, two point four million divided by eight percent, that number comes out to a thirty million dollar value. And that makes starts making sense. I have a thirty million dollar value of this building, and probably seventy five percent of it works out to twenty four million and change. And at twenty four million of twenty at seventy five percent twenty four million and change. At that, at that, at those numbers, at twenty-two million dollars in change. I'm sorry, that's the actual. It's actual here, twenty-two million nine oh four. At that number, it roughly is in the same number of what the debt yield works out to. There's an ex, a mistake here. I'm not going. I'm not going to talk, talk about the mistake now. I'm going to go. I'm going to go soon and explain the mistake and, and get through it in a second. So the debt yield, which is telling you what's the minimum debt yield the bank wants. So again, everything like I told you is based off the NOI, the net cash flow, whatever your final net number is. You can apply cap rate for the value. And you can apply. You could. You could apply to the net cash flow after all your expenses. You could <coughs> reserves. You could put the debt yield number there. Minimum debt service coverage is one twenty. We discussed what that is. You need a buffer of twenty percent. Maximum loan to value is seventy five percent. If you call up a lender that says I'll go to eighty, you're just changing this number and the whole spreadsheet here would update accordingly. So, this is where the mistake came in. The projected NOI of a building is always before TI and LC, before tenant improvement and leasing commission. Because if you want to know what a building's worth, worth has nothing to do with the specific scenario that you chose a 30 at least for a tenant. You chose Starbucks as your tenant versus a mom and pop coffee shop. You chose to have these expenses versus those expenses. So to compare apples to apples, what's the NOI? We've discussed, an NOI is consistent. However, you're coming to a bank to borrow money from it, so then I care about the uniquenesses of you. What uniquenesses do you have in your specific building? Oh, I have a lot of TI and LC, a lot of tenant pro and leasing companies. I have a lot of reserves because a lot of maintenance has to be done for the roof. So the projected N at NCF is net cash flow, and the typo is at the bottom. The math is right, but the typo is wrong. It's after tenant improvement the leasing commission, and that brings you a $2 million number. It's basically for this deal, it comes out, it was about $400,000, the difference of NOI and, and, and net cash flow was built in for reserves, tenant improvement, and leasing commissions. So when you look at the bottom of the page, you go back, projected NOI, before TI, the word before is supposed to be switched to after. So it's after TI. So the math is right on the page. The formulas are right, but the label is wrong. So that's why all he has available to him is $2 million. And the bank says, if all you have is $2 million available to you, the most I'm willing to lend you with $2 million available to you Debt yield of nine, two million divided by nine percent, that's the most I'm willing to lend to you. So when I go, if someone was calling me up as a mortgage broker, and they're looking to do a Wall Street, a loan, a retail loan, a Wall Street, 
For me, if I want to just know and break it down, how much can I lend the person? It sounds so complicated to analyze, no, analyze, no analyzing required. I call my QTS department. I could say, on a retail deal in blank, what is the lowest debt yield we could get? Mm, eight and a half to nine. In a conversation with a client, is that after everything's said and done, what's your net cash flow? Or when he sends me a spreadsheet, it's right there at the bottom, the lowest number. I just take that number, divide it by eight and a half percent. That's the, I said, listen, if it appraises out, I don't care if you appraise out for $50 million. The most I'm lending you is, makes it simple. Till now, think about when we, we discussed this during the, uh, the session previously. You have to figure out the balance, the, the, the NOI, the net cash flow. Put a 120 coverage, calculate your budget. It's money more steps. The net cash flow, the, 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 the debt yield makes it just one number. Get me my net cash flow, apply a debt yield number to it, that's the most you could possibly borrow. It appraises out, you got $22 million, and that's how much I'm willing to lend you. In this case over here, because we went to the, 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 the bottom, if you look, it says 22,924 is the most you could borrow. But in a case like this, if they're using an eight cap on this building, at 75%, from loan to value, it's 22,904. Here's the example in reverse that we had the other time. I'm telling you, listen, I could lend you, it's actually, it's almost the same. I could lend you 22,924, but I don't think it's gonna appraise out to support it. It's pretty close. I'll get you down to 22,904. Now, when you're dealing with a banker, a relationship, a friend, you say, do me a favor. The math works in 924, just, just let me 924. Don't stop me $20,000 short on a $22 million loan. Sounds ridiculous. Doesn't work on Wall Street. It's, remember, it's all logic. The guy's like, if you could figure out how you got a couple more dollars in your NOI, you could figure out if we could appraise this building at a 7.99 cap, it might work, then you're fine. There's no, it's logic. It has to fit a box. It has to reconcile, everything has to reconcile. So cool you know, when you call up the appraiser and told you an eight cap, I said, do you think you get, when he, most appraisers negotiate in quarter point increments for the most part. Seven cap, seven and a quarter cap, seven and a half cap, nine cap, nine and a quarter cap. So that's the lingo. Because it usually is not that sensitive, that difference in between. So maybe they might actually, the math, give you a number, but they typically, they round it off to give you a round number. You could say, listen, I know you can't really get lower, but I need just a 7.97. You think you'd get there? Oh, that I can get you. I didn't realize that you're that sensitive to that last dollar. Yeah, that I'll get you. That's because it's an opinion. Compared to seven and three quarters, or eight, I'm telling you I'm using eight. But if you need a few basis points, I'll get a few. Also, if you go back now to the expenses on the building, you look through the expenses and you say, you know something? This expense that I have over here, I didn't care to save an extra $2,000. I realized if I figure out mathematically how much more in NOI do I need, I could, I'll look through differently. In the beginning, oh, it's $2,000, just keep going. But now I need 2000 The other part of the equation is I was saying originally about the rents. So the owner sent me the rent roll. It's not going to close for three months. It's not going to be securitized for another four months. So sometimes the lender would say, if you have a, a, a lease in place that the anniversary date, as long as the anniversary date is before four, seven months from today, which is three months we're going to close, and then four months till I securitize, I'll give you credit for that. So you comb through the whole lease, the, all, the, all the lease, all the rent uh, renewal dates. When the lease was signed in June, that means have, it has a rent bump in June of the next year. I go through all the numbers. Oh, there's a 2% rent bump. Good. I'll give you credit for now. You could change that income now. I change that income now. I have an extra income. It trickles down to NOI. It works at a long amount that I'm looking to go ahead and use. So if you go back towards the top, just to go down the list, projected NOI, projected NCF, net, net cash flow, annual debt service. That's just the formula of figuring it out. It works that based, on, based on the loan amount that you're going to want, the bottom left corner from loan to value, it works towards a 1.41 debt service coverage. Estimated loan to value is 75%. And then you skip to loan constraints. This is just showing you from each line item how much you're able to borrow so you can figure out where there's wiggle room, where there's no wiggle room, and you can figure out how much you're able to borrow. You change one number in the Excel spreadsheet, somewhere it works. So typically the great broker knows how to do everything, but he's not the one doing all the work, I say. They have an underwriting department. So they often say we have a whole department that's underwriting, set up department. They take the spreadsheets and all the information from the borrower and deliver to the broker these next four pages. So the broker just analyzes the next four pages. And if the borrower is looking for $21 million, it's great. It's for sure going to work. No, not, not too much work has to get done. If the borrower is looking for $24 million, okay, now he has to get his roll up his sleeves and be creative and figure things out and work it through 
but this is that starting point comes from here. If this works, that's why even though in order for this course, this shouldn't have been the first page you look at. But for the reality of how you do business, this is the first page. Because if these pa this numbers work, then it, were, it pays to go to the other pages. If you can't get these numbers to work at all, you're wasting your time. Going, it's not gonna get better as time goes on. It's gonna get worse as time goes on. So now if you flip to the second page, this is the same setup that we had before, but much more in detail. This shows you underwriting, what we'll, the world we're living in right now, underwriting column towards the right, and it shows you the historicals. So they obviously didn't update uh, the, they just didn't update the headers, but as far as you're concerned, if you care about just the concept here, is that now a normal deal, you, when you get a deal to buy, you're only gonna see the underwriting column. What the expenses and projections they have for today. But now by lining up with it, the last two years, you can go across the board. So now you look at the first line, <clears throat> income, two and a half million dollars. Okay, gross potential base rent. Last year was two, th two, three, seven, nine. The year before, two, three, oh, seven. Makes sense. Rent should be going up every year and it's not a crazy big jump. So there's no reason for questions. Line number two is less mark to market. Less mark to market is if there are rents in the building that are higher than the market because rents are going down, we'll have to mark to market. So if I have a, a tenant paying me $20 a foot, the mark that is 18, my poten I'm actually getting two and a half million, but forget about vacancies. You have to take away $2 a foot from that tenant and let's mark the market, deduct some of that money. But to keep on is that here's the example of a building showing you how reimbursements work. These, this income is because aside from my rent, I also have $220,000 in reimbursement income for fuel. CAM is common area maintenance. Water, sewer, real estate taxes, so total reimbursement income. So you have from, from you know, on the, net, on, on the line after of, of antenna income, and there's other, there's other items that you can have there. There's things that are not normal for the building. Whatever they're gonna be, you wanna put them in at that line. This is a miscellaneous, is this miscellaneous that goes in. Here's your total gross potential income of 2.9. So this building has 2.9 in income. Less of physical vacancy is actually a 5.91% vacancy, 173,000, so you don't have to add anything to it. But here's your slide asking questions. The fact that the history of last year is a much bigger vacancy. This building always trended at 10% vacancy. So even though it makes sense, I sign more leases, but one second, if I was underwriting this loan, I was, I was doing this as a lender or if as a buyer, I'm not gonna give you credit, just take away 10% of vacancy, a 5% vacancy. It historically had 10%. So what's going on over here? If I hear a good story, I'll buy it. it makes logical sense that now turn the corner, he fixed up the building, he was, he was doing over the building the last three years, so part of the building was always under construction, and now it's fully rented. Again, the logical <coughs> story. You're gonna have people buy the story and not buy the story, but that's how the, these line items work. And throughout, effective gross income is 22.6 million, which works out to 19,000 foot, okay? Now, if you have, okay, uh, okay just to skip back over here, if, if you didn't buy the story, you made them bring the vacancy to 10%. So that's why the underwrite adjustment of another 4.09, another 120,000 in vacancy, brings you 293. What's your effective gross income? $19 a foot. Now, the first thing someone's gonna look at, if they know, if they know the market, they can turn around and say, no one's paying $19 a foot, they're paying 16 a foot, they're paying 21, oh no, the market's 21, there's upside in this building. I bought this building, there's a lot of room here, because I can get the rent up from 19 to 21. Now you might turn the page and realize the lease is on there for the next 30 years, so have all the upside I want, but it takes me 30 years to realize it, so it doesn't really help me accordingly. Now, the key difference when we're doing deals right with the bank, the relationships we set up, is I'm not looking to pull wool, pull wool over anyone's eyes. I also want to be sophisticated and above board and anticipate any issues and let them know up front. So if there's really an issue that requires a comment, I'm gonna put that comment in. So now let's go to the next line. I have a management expense. 3%, 2.9, up to four, like what's going on over here? Why is it changing? So the comments could be is that, one is that the person actually has a $75,000 contract. Look at the bottom one, management is a flat fee of $75,000. The reason why anyway I'm putting 4% is because I know no lender is gonna look at a deal below, 4, below a 4% management fee. So it's good to anyway point out to the lender, I know you're putting 4% between me and you, just realize, I really have $30,000 here as a buffer in between because I have a contract. If this deal is very tight 
and it made a difference, I would call back up the lender and negotiate with the lender and say, do me a favor. Could you agree to a $75,000 number? I have a contract with a reputable firm for the last 20 years is what I pay them because I need that 30,000 for underwriting. Anyway, you know I'm not paying it anyway. If you put it there for underwriting, I need it to get my loan up that $20,000 at the end. So can you give me some of this? Can you agree to a number? Again, it's a logical conversation that if they buy into it and they believe that it's not just unique to you, but if they foreclose on the property, they could also maintain that $75,000 number, then they could go for it. And as you go line by line, these are in this area where this building was could have different types of line items of expenses. And based on that, it gives expenses at, at, at the bottom. So I care to show, for example, bullet point number two. So you're seeing gas went from 64,000, 67,000 to 37. You lost the also what you're telling me now, it's $30,000 cheaper. I know it's gonna be a question. The answer is gas owner took advantage of prepaid discount. So the land owner was doing it differently and I can maintain this. Now again, is, do I think it's a one-time deal I go cheaper? But no, from now on it'll be cheaper. If I'm the lender, I'm the buyer, you underwrite it, but here's a flag that was raised on the question. They won. I was willing to pay a higher price for this building. And I realized, oh, there's a problem. It's not 37,000 expenses here, there's 67,000 or 65,000. Then you go to the next, I'm skipping down to the next one of the three, repairs and maintenance. 97,000, 100,000, 67, come on. Trying to like show me that projection agony, it's gonna be great. Maybe you can not stop neglecting the building. So over here, number three, parking lot was repaved in 2012 for $35,000. For $35, so that's why, there's. We did repairs and maintenance, but it was a one-time expense. So I don't have it all the time. Now, but I'm, if, I was, if I was the lender, I'd say, yeah, but what about 2011? It seems like every year, this one-time expense, so very good. 65 is what you know of, and there's always gonna be a $30,000 expense, or no. So the last two years, they had a lot of improvements to the building, and I threw it into the repairs and maintenance line. Okay, let's listen to the story, and I'll back it up. That's this page. The next page is the rent bill. Has a couple of extra things here. OCTC has 7,000 square foot in that, for, in that spot. They moved in this date, the lease ends this date. It gives an impression to a lender how long they've been there. So they get comfortable. Are they really going to move? It's new, coming and going. And what is the base year? What do they pay? They pay 130000 which works out to $17 a foot. There's notes are relevant here. There's a bunch of leases there. Tenant moved in about 60 days ago. All the space is renovated. It's brand new. So sometimes they have actually a different um, 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 prices and they have different locations in the building, different actual rooms that have different leases, sometimes one lease in total. I always put out a lease to the bank. I sort it by the largest tenants down. So the bank gets an impression, where's the real risk here? The top few tenants. They have a lease till 2027. If they're a strong tenant, I look at their financials, I'm good. But I know they're covered till 2027. That's because they total of this space. 9, 18, 27, plus 6 is 33. They're roughly 33% of the building that they have here. The next tenant is 9%. They're here. Now there's a problem. They're coming due next year. I'm really concerned about that spot. So what's the plan? This will be a flag. You could lose 10% of your tenants next year. I'm going with the assumption that this thing was written in 2013. So if you look at those numbers, that becomes a discussion. Reserve for it, escort for it, go back and forth. There's a discussion of what's going to happen now. And that's how it works line by line on each item. The next page is for me the most fascinating part of the whole entire page. The top part sums up the reality, the beginning. The average rent in the building happens to be $18.50 a foot. NRSF is net rentable square feet. I'm able to rent out 135,000 square feet in the center. What's the economic vacancy? What vacancy factor does a lender use? 10% vacancy back, like we saw on the first page. That's why he had to increase your physical vacancy to underwriting vacancy and bring us to 10%. The loan amount is for 10 years. The analysis period we're gonna do now is for 11 years. One year past the term. Renewal term. The average lease that's been signed in this building has been five year leases. The renewal term I'm gonna assume is five years. Now, here's renewal probability. This is logic backed by reality of what's been going on in that neighborhood, that area. What percent chance, what this page is gonna figure out from you, is how much money do I have to put away for that rainy day? When that lease comes due, I showed you examples of tenants coming due in a year. How much money do I need? 
The answer is I need enough money to cover tenant improvements and leasing commissions. But how much is that going to cost me? What's the chance? What's the odds? Play the odds game. So the odds of saying is that it's going to cost you a 65% chance that the tenant's going to stay. And a 35% chance that the tenant's going to go. When the same tenant stays, many times there's very little in, in, in commissions or none. You don't have to pay a commission to the original leasing broker. On the renewal, you pay them a lot of money up until now. For the renewal, you pay much less. For the tenant improvements to the tenants, how much is he going to have to do? Tenant's been there already. Paint for him, give him some money back, but not much. If a new tenant comes in, brand new commissions. Brand new tenant improvements. A lot more work has to happen. So this 65% is a negotiation. But this is just telling you the standard assumption is assuming a 65% chance. So this spreadsheet, using these assumptions, will calculate everything as it goes down the line. So tenant improvements, how much is it going to cost me? For a new tenant, you have to give a new tenant $6 a foot. You're going to charge him $18 a foot. 1,000 square feet, he's going to pay $18,000 rent. You know how much money you're giving him to fix up the space? Six dollars. You give him six thousand dollars worth of money before he even moves into you. An existing tenant renews the market, and he comes to market rent. He's already there. You, it's a negotiation. He doesn't want to move because he has expenses to move. You have expenses to get a new tenant. You meet in the middle, give him three dollars worth. So that's why a lot of times someone works for a company. So my boss is the cheapest guy in the whole entire world. Yes, it's amazing. He painted, he carpeted, he did nothing. His lease came due. That was a freebie if it was put into the space. He put the money into the space. It wasn't him. If he had the option to take $2 in his pocket or $3 in the space, he would have taken $2, put the $3 the landlord put into the space. Leasing commission is 5%. If I hired a new tenant, I'd probably have to give 5% for the life of the lease. A renewal is maybe only 2% for the life of the, a renewal period. So the rest from the hair to the bottom is purely taking math and calculating based on every piece of information that was put into the spreadsheet up until now. What is the blended rate? If 65% of my tenant, my tenant is going to stay, it's going to cost me $3, and 35% chance they're going to leave, and I'm going to pay $6 for that. So it's 35% of every square foot I have to give. For 35% of it, I have to pay $6. And for 65% of it, I have to pay $3. The blend works out to 405 on tenant improvements. Leasing commissions. If I have to pay a 5%, Okay, of $18 for the life of the loan for five years. So I've had to 18 for every foot. I have is every foot is really worth $18 times five years because we're saying it's a five year lease. That brings me to $90. 5% of $90. And if, the, if I get a new tenant, and 2% of 90, of $90 if the tenant stays. But there's a 65 25% probability. It works out that for every square foot, I have to assume I'm going to have to reserve $6.87. Now, if you take this Excel spreadsheet, and I'm going to ask if you want to get it sent to you, however you got this far in the course, ask them to send it to you. I'll send you this Excel spreadsheet in Excel so you can play with these numbers. You'll be able to see that if you would change the $6 on top to seven, or this, 65%, all these numbers change. But ultimately, based on this assumption, this is what happened. In year number one, I, let's skip the month to month part. In 2013, 3,200 square feet are set to expire. That happens to be 2% of the, of, the, of the gross leasing area. Tenant improvements, you're gonna have to reserve $13,000 for, and leasing commissions, $9,000 for. Works out to 22,000, which is the same $6.87 cents times 32.54. That's how you got there. The next year, there's 19,000 square feet. So you have to renew $130,000 you'll need. Now here's the cool part. Jump to 2018. In 2018, I have 9,300 square feet rolling, same formula. But then I have total expiration is 12,000. Why? Because that lease you signed in 2013 is coming due again five years later. So if you do a loan today, and you have to do analysis for, for five years, for 11 years, and you have a lease coming due today, you have to come, away, come up with money for, for today, again in year six, and again in year 11 all that money. What this does is it tells you that over the life of this lease, a life of this loan, you will need 960,000 divided by 10, brings you $96,000 a year. On this loan, you're gonna have to pay 
your mortgage payment. And the bank's going to say, before you net cash flow, you have to reserve T, I, and L, C an additional $96,000. So when you go back and say, this loan didn't work for more than that, we want the 22 million and we will short by 20,000. If you could get this number lowered, then you're in good shape because then you have more available cash flow to pay the mortgage. So this discussion, this is where sometimes you'll use the discussion, tell the bank, do me a favor, let me just put money in reserve they want to do a hold back. Or I don't, I don't agree with the assumption here. I agree with the overall math, 65, this makes sense, but you know something? My anchor tenant is there for 20 something years. So on a blended average for my building, the probability is this, or the average lease is not five years, it's seven years. And you're gonna play with these numbers sometimes. And if you could convince the bank that don't call an average at least five years, call it seven, you win on how often you have to deal with this tenant, but you lose on how big the commission is. So if I have a lot of leases rolling in the first year, and I can convince a bank that my leases I'm gonna sign at seven years, I'm better off. It may cost me more when it renews. Same money for the construction, the tenant improvement, but the leasing commissions are more expensive. However, year one, year eight, year 15 is when it rolls. I only have to deal with twice. I have to deal with many of my tenants only twice versus three times, or better yet, every lease that, lease that rolls as of five years from now, I only have to deal with once, because five years, and it goes to, to year number 12, it's already two years past my loan, I'm in good shape. So these become detailed negotiations. The reason I, I'm, I'm, I'm not spending a lot of time on this, it's not relevant to 99% of the loan. It's not relevant, A, because most people are buying multifamily. B, who's to say you're even gonna end up buying real estate? C, if you do, down to this level is usually not making a difference in the deal. You have some, some analysts doing spreadsheet work for you is coming up with these numbers. It's important to you to understand the concepts so when someone can know more, they can negotiate more and be able to go make things happen from that point. I'm gonna stop here.